if people really take this stuff to heart, they really have to take it to heart. In my experience, people who go through that process do not return to denial, do not stay in despair, and they end up in a spirit of cherishing what they have, what they are cherishing their loved ones, cherishing a walk in nature, um, and, be, and cherishing the opportunity to be open and honest about your feelings and how you see the world and stop pretending. I felt that a lot of people in my sphere were not really able to face up to the latest climate data and the impacts on human societies uh, and therefore question what they were doing because they didn't have any kind of map at all. And so that was why I decided to um, come up with what I could call deep adaptation. And it's uh, three key questions. And it's because also I, I wanted to not say there are simple answers here because we're not in control anymore. That's, that's the key thing. And we will act without knowing really whether we're going to be successful in this very um, uh, uncertain time. So I then introduced since uh, the three R's. The first one is simply, what is it that we most value, which we want to keep? So it's a question of really going deep into, um, not just trying to keep things as they are, but what is it that we most value that we want to keep? And then the second question is, is the reverse of that then. What is it that we must let go of, or we'll make matters worse? And I call that relinquishment. Um, and then the third thing, which is, well, what have we sort of lost over the last decades in our hydrocarbon fueled fantasy civilization, which we can, which we could bring back to help. Um, so I call that restoration, and that could be simple things like uh, growing food in our back gardens and uh, spending time with our neighbours playing games rather than just sitting in our own air conditioned centrally heated flats watching telly. I would just put it as three questions um, to invite people beyond the progressivist framing of what comes next. So you'll notice in that framing, it's not what do we need to invent or what do we need to do to like more, more of it. It's, 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 it starts from a place of um, just breathing, letting go and, ah, oh, okay, whoops, <laughs> we've really messed up and let's think again with the less hubris about where we go from here. So that, that because I, I think any attempt to offer a bright vision of the future at the moment is an exercise in delusion. Um, for me, I have hope that more and more people will wake up to what's important in life for themselves, and it will include things like curious, kind, and joyful connection with all life, people, and nature. Um, and a vision would be that we find that there are many, many more people with open hearts and minds exploring together what the hell to do next rather than being set on their worldview and proving themselves right because they are scared of the uncertainty that we pass. So I don't have vision or hope where it's like a fixed way of life. <laughs> it's this process that, uh, that I know we're all capable of, but we're also all capable of doing some awful things because we're, we're, we're frantic, because we're panicked, and, and we want to come up with excuses for ourselves um, for being selfish. Um, so I'm. You, you can see where where I've gone with this. It's it's to to go back to core existential questions about you know well, what do we value and why we're we here and what do we want to stand for even if we're 
even if we're gonna sink. <laughs> What I've been doing with people who are very incredulous about this analysis is to say, yes, you should be. And therefore, I really can't say anything other than check it out for yourself. And then say, well, I've, I've spent a few months looking at the latest stuff and it's there, download it and, and read it. Uh, and also, when you're reading it, accept that you don't want to accept it. That's normal. Um, so therefore, rather than postponing your view, and also that can be something else, is that you, you think, oh, I don't know if I like this, so I just won't look into it. So you postpone your conclusion on it. So rather than that, accept that you don't want to accept it. And therefore, for a thought experiment, try, well, what if this is the case? What would that mean? For me and when you do the what if know that many people throughout centuries in fact millennia and also people that we know alive today have said that despair um is a transition you know there's a, there's a you don't just go into despair and, and stay there so that you can have a faith that if you go into despair there will be something on the other side um, and therefore you will find new, a new basis for understanding equanimity, meaning and joy after despair. So this is how I invite people to really look at this stuff for themselves, because I don't think it would be right if they just listened to me and said, yeah, okay, fine. Um, because that would be um, for such a, that means maybe they wouldn't be taking it to heart. This is such a massive fundamental challenge to everything we do. Like, should we get up and go to work? Where should I live? What do I believe is the meaning of life in general and my life in particular? Um, am I prepared to kill someone who comes to my house to steal all my food? Or actually, do I believe in higher, uh, certain values uh, that are more important than just prolonging my life from those of my children. I mean, or if, if people really take this stuff to heart, they really have to take it to heart, not just leave it on as an interesting thing on a piece of paper. Um, and so that's what I'm inviting people to do. And I'm, in my experience, people who go through that process do not return to denial, do not stay in despair, and even if their initial instinct is survivalist and they think about buying bulletproof vests and, um, you know, buying lots of um, tin food, they soon realize that that's not how they wish to live. That's not really the full expression of who they are. Uh, and they end up in a spirit of cherishing what they have, what they are cherishing their loved ones, cherishing a walk in nature um, and, be, and cherishing the opportunity to be open and honest about your feelings and how you see the world and stop pretending. As the environmental constraints begin to feed through into a reduction in the, the quality of life and the hopes and aspirations of the general public, they become more sensitized to extremist perspectives, uh, whether that's religious or particularly right-wing. And so we're seeing that happening everywhere. And um, global value surveys show us that people no longer believe that their children will have a better uh, life than themselves. They don't believe that their tomorrows will be better. And they also show us that people are turning away from um, liberal progressive values in many countries and there's a rise of nativism and traditional values this i think is showing that people are intuiting that something's up um and therefore that social contract that's implicit that you you uh you kind of obey 
you you know you go to school you work hard you respect your teachers you respect the government you respect your boss you save you do the right thing you'll have a good life once that's breaking down which i think it is in many people's subconscious if not consciously i think we're seeing increasingly consciously uh, then then people start questioning everything and and if and and the people who come along and say well blame them over there um or just listen to me i'm a big powerful guy who'll fix it for you and i'll give you a little bit of a adrenaline rush by making you feel great again then um that that's what's going to happen and i think we're beginning to see it We do not know whether we're going extinct this century, the human race. I think the current science makes it um, an intellectually credible point of view to say that we are going extinct. To say it's inevitable is very, very, very uh, questionable. Um, absolutely, but but you can have it. You can now marshal an argument that the human race is going extinct this century, and. Therefore, I think I think it's important that people take that on board and really think, what if? And that's what I did. And it it takes you to another level of grief, and it invites you to another place in terms of what is it that you would believe in if you thought we were going extinct. And then it, what is good is that it it can. It, it makes you pay attention to things, more transcendental questions, transcendent ideas of love, compassion, kindness, beauty, etc. And also, it invites you to think about: Well, humans were the potentiality of this planet, and therefore, if we value humans, we also value that potentiality of this planet. And something like our consciousness will come again. And so, it, it extends that sense of identity and compassion to the natural world. And therefore, we well, what kind of ancestors are we to whatever is a higher form of consciousness that comes next after humans? Because humans would always go extinct at some point. Every species does. So, um, and then it raises questions like, well, what do we do with 400 odd nuclear power stations? Um, so then it means we need to take seriously when uh, having internationally internationally operative swap teams to bring nuclear power stations to cold shut down to do something about. Securing the, the radioactive cooling pools um, for in countries where there is collapse, um, and I don't know. The thing is that this agenda is huge. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that exists already, <laughs> publicly or privately. I have no idea. But um, it's just once you switch into this mindset of that collapse is coming, it raises a, it, it changes what you talk about. Um, and I, that's what my work is now doing. It's inviting people to think, uh, create imaginatively about, well, what do we do if we think collapse is coming?